A Prisoner in the Caucasus by Leo Tolstoy. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Prisoner in the Caucasus. Chapter 1. A Russian of rank was serving as an officer in the army of the Caucasus. His name was Zhilin. There came to him one day a letter from his home. His aged mother wrote him, I am now getting along in years, and before I die I should like to see my beloved son. Come and bid me farewell, lay me in the ground, and then, with my blessing, return again to your service. And I have been finding a bride for you, and she is intelligent and handsome and has property. If you like, you can marry and settle down together. Jilin cogitated. It is very true, the old lady has been growing feeble. Maybe I shall not have a chance to see her again. Let us go, and if the bride is pretty, then I might marry. He went to his colonel, got his leave of absence, took his farewell of his comrades, gave the soldiers of his command nine gallons of vodka as a farewell treat, and made his arrangements to depart. There was war at that time in the Caucasus. The roads were not open for travel either by day or night. If any of the Russians rode or walked outside of the fortress, the Tartars were likely either to kill him or carry him off to the mountains, and it was arranged that twice a week an escort of soldiers should go from fortress to fortress. In front and behind marched the soldiers, and the travelers rode in the middle. It was now summer time. At sunrise the baggage train was made up behind the fortification. The guard of soldiery marched ahead, and the procession moved along the road. Jirin was on horseback, and his effects were on a cart that formed part of the train. They had twenty-five vests to travel. The train marched slowly, sometimes the soldiers halted, sometimes a wagon wheel came off, or a horse balked, and all had to stop and wait. The sun was already past the zenith, but the train had only gone halfway, so great were the dust and heat. The sun was baking hot, and nowhere was there shelter. A bald step, not a tree or a shrub on the road. Jilin rode on ahead, occasionally stopping and waiting till the train caught up with him. He would listen and hear the signal on the horn to halt again. And Jilin thought, would I better go on alone without the soldiers? I have a good horse under me. If I fall in with the Tatars, I can escape, or shall I wait? He kept stopping and pondering, and just then another officer, also on horseback, rode up to him. His name was Kostulin, and he had a musket. He said, Jilin, let us ride on ahead together. I am so hungry that I cannot stand it any longer, and the heat too. You could wring my shirt out. Kostulin was a heavy, stout, ruddy man, and the sweat was dripping from him. Jilin reflected and said, And your musket is loaded? It is. All right, let us go. Only one condition, not to separate. And they started on up the road. They rode along the step, talking and looking on each side. There was a wide sweep of view. As soon as the step came to an end, the road went into a pass between two mountains. And Jilin said, I must ride up on that mountain and reconnoiter. Otherwise, you see, they might come down from the mountain and surprise us. But Kostulin said, What is there to reconnoiter? Let us go ahead. Jilin did not heed him. No, says he, you wait for me here below. I'll just glance around. And he spurred his horse up the mountain to the left. The horse that Jilin rode was a hunter. He had bought him out of a drove of colts, paying a hundred roubles for him, and he had himself trained him. He bore him up the steep slope as on wings. He had hardly reached the summit, when before him less than seven hundred feet distant, mounted Tatars were standing, thirty men. He saw them and started to turn back, but the Tatars had caught sight of him. They set out in pursuit of him, unstrapping their weapons as they gallop. Jilin dashes down the precipice with all the speed of his horse and cries to Kostulin, Fire your gun! And to his horse he says, though not aloud, Little mother, carry me safely, don't stumble. If you trip, I am lost. If we get back to the gun, we won't fall into their hands. But Kostulin, instead of waiting for him, as soon as he saw the Tatars, galloped on with all his might toward the fortress. With his whip he belabored his horse, first on one side, then on the other. All that could be seen through the dust was a horse swishing her tail. 
Jeline saw that his case was desperate. The gun was gone. Nothing was to be done with a saber alone. He turned his horse back toward the train. He thought he might escape that way. But in front of him, he sees that six are galloping down the steep. His horse is good, but theirs are better, and besides, they have got the start of him. He started to wheel about and was going to dash ahead again, but his horse had got momentum and could not be held back. He flew straight down toward them. He sees a red-bearded Tatar approaching him on a gray mare. He is gaining on him. He gnashes his teeth. He is getting his gun ready. Well, thinks Jeline, I know you devils. If you should take me prisoner, you would put me in a hole and flog me with a whip. I won't give myself up alive. Now Jeline was not of great size, but he was an Ulan. He drew his saber, spurred his horse straight at the red-bearded Tartar. He says to himself, either I will crush him with my horse or I will hack him down with my saber. Jeline, however, did not reach the place on horseback. Suddenly behind him, gunshots were fired at the horse. The horse fell headlong and pinned Jeline's leg to the ground. He tried to arise, but already ill-smelling Tatars were sitting on him and pinioning his hands behind his back. He burst from them, knocking the Tatars over, but three others had dismounted from their horses and began to beat him on the head with their gun stocks. His sight failed him, and he staggered. The Tatars seized him, took from their saddles extra saddle girths, bent his arms behind his back, fastened them with a Tatar knot, and lifted him up. They took his saber from him, pulled off his boots, made a thorough search of him, pulled out his money and his watch, tore his clothes all to pieces. Jeline glanced at his horse. The poor beast lay as he had fallen on his side and was kicking, vainly trying to rise. In his head was a hole, and from the hole the black blood was pouring. The dust for an arshin around was wet with it. A Tartar went to the horse to remove the saddle. He was still kicking, so the man took out his dagger and cut his throat. The throat gave a whistling sound, a trembling ran over the body, and all was over. The Tartars took off the saddle and the other trappings. The one with the red beard mounted his horse, and the others lifted Jeline behind him to keep him from falling. They fastened him with the reins to the Tartar's belt, and thus they carried him off to the mountains. Jeline sat behind, swaying and bumping his face against the stinking Tatar's back. All that he could see before him was the healthy Tatar back and the sinewy neck and a smooth-shaven nape showing blue beneath the cap. Jeline's head ached. The blood trickled into his eyes, and it was impossible for him to get a more comfortable position on the horse or wipe away the blood. His arms were so tightly bound that his collarbones ached. They rode along from mountain to mountain. They forded a river, then they entered a highway and rode along a valley. Jeline tried to follow the route that they took him, but his eyes were glued together with blood, and it was impossible for him to turn around. It began to grow dark. They crossed still another river and began to climb a rocky mountain. There was an odor of smoke. The barking of dogs was heard. They had reached an owl. Footnote. Owl is a Tartar village. End of footnote. The Tartars dismounted. The Tartar children came running up and surrounded Jeline, whistling and exulting. Finally, they began to fling stones at him. The Tartar drove away the children, lifted Jeline from the horse, and called a servant. A Nogai with prominent cheekbones came at the call. He wore only a shirt. The shirt was torn. His whole breast was bare. The Tartar said something to him. The servant brought a footstock. It consisted of two oaken blocks provided with iron rings, and in one of the rings was a clamp with a lock. They unfastened Jeline's arms, put on the stock, and took him to a barn, pushed him in, and shut the door. Jeline fell on the manure. As he lay there, he felt round in the darkness, and when he found a place that was less foul, he stretched himself out. Chapter 2 Jeline scarcely slept that night. The nights were short. He saw through a crack that it was growing light. Jeline got up, widened the crack, and managed to look out. Through the crack he could see a road leading down from the mountain. At the right, a Tartar saklia with two trees near it. Footnote. A saklia is a mountain hut in the Caucasus. End of footnote. A black dog was lying on the road. A she-goat with her kids was walking by, all of them shaking their tails. He saw coming down the mountain a young Tatar girl in a variegated shirt, ungirdled in pantalets and boots. 
Her head was covered with a kaftan, and on it she bore a great tin water jug. She walked along, swaying and bending her back, and holding by the hand a little Tartar urchin with shaven head who wore a single shirt. After the Tartar maiden had passed with her water jug, the red-bearded Tartar of the evening before came out, wearing a silk beshmet, a silver dagger in his belt, and sandals on his bare feet. On his head was a high cap of sheepskin, dyed black, and with a point hanging down. He came out, stretched himself, stroked his beard. He paused, gave some order to the servant, and went off somewhere. Then two children on horseback came along on their way to the watering trough. The hind quarters of the horses were wet. Other shaven-headed youngsters, with nothing but shirts on and nothing on their legs, formed a little band and came to the barn. They got a dry stick and stuck it through the crack. Jeline growled, Ugh! at them. The children began to cry and scatter in every direction as fast as their legs would carry them. Only their bare knees glistened. But Jeline began to be thirsty. His throat was parched. He said to himself, I wonder if they won't come to look after me. Suddenly the barn doors are thrown open. The red tartar came in, and with him another, of slighter stature and of dark complexion. His eyes were bright and black, his cheeks ruddy, his little beard well trimmed, his face jolly and always enlivened with a grin. The dark man's clothing was still richer, a silk beshmet of blue silk embroidered with gold lace. In his belt, a great silver dagger, handsome Morocco slippers embroidered with silver, and over the fine slippers he wore a large pair of stout ones. His cap was tall, of white lamb's wool. The red tartar came in, muttered something, gave vent to some abusive language, and then stood leaning against the wall, fingering his dagger, and scowling under his brow at Jeline like a wolf. But the dark Tartar, nervous and active and always on the go, as though he were made of springs, came straight up to Jeline, squatted down on his heels, showed his teeth, tapped him on the shoulder, began to gabble something in his own language, winked his eyes, and, clucking his tongue, kept saying, A fine rose, a fine rose. Jeline did not understand him, and said, Drink, give me some water. The dark one grinned, A fine rose, and all the time he kept babbling. Jeline signified by his hands and lips that they should give him water. The dark one understood, grinned, put his head out of the door, and cried, Dina! A young girl came running in, a slender, lean creature of thirteen, with a face like the dark man's. Evidently, she was his daughter. She was dressed in a long blue shirt, with wide sleeves and without a belt. On the bottom, on the breast, and on the cuffs, it was relieved with red trimmings. She wore on her legs pantalettes and slippers, and over the slippers another pair with high heels. On her neck was a necklace, wholly composed of half-ruble pieces. Her head was uncovered. She had her hair in a black braid, and on the braid was a ribbon, and to the ribbon were attached various ornaments and a silver ruble. Her father gave her some command. She ran out and quickly returned, bringing a little tin pitcher. After she had handed him the water, she also squatted on her heels in such a way that her knees were higher than her shoulders. She sits that way and opens her eyes and stares at Jeline while he drinks, as though he were some wild beast. Jeline offered to return the pitcher to her. She darted away like a wild goat. Even her father laughed. He sent her after something else. She took the pitcher, ran out, and brought back some unleavened bread on a small round board, and again squatted down and stared without taking her eyes from him. The Tartars went out and again bolted the door. After a while the Nogai also comes to Jeline and says, Aida, Kozyain, Aida, but he does not know Russian either. Jeline, however, perceived that he wished him to go somewhere. Jeline hobbled out with his clog. It was impossible to walk, so he had to drag one leg. The Nogai led the way for him. He sees before him a Tatar village of half a score of houses and the native mosque with its minaret. In front of one house stood three horses saddled. Lads held them by the bridle. From this house came the dark Tatar and waved his hand, signifying that Jeline was to come to him. He grinned and kept saying something in his own tongue and went into the house. Jeline followed him. The room was decent, the walls were smoothly plastered with clay, against the front wall were placed feather beds, on the sides hung costly rugs, 
On the rugs were guns, pistols, and sabers, all silver-mounted. On one side a little oven was set in, on a level with the floor. The floor was of earth, clean as a threshing floor, and the whole of the front portion was covered with felt. Rugs were distributed over the felt, and on the rugs were down pillows. On the rugs were sitting some Tatars in slippers only, the dark Tatar, the red-bearded one, and three guests. Behind their backs, down cushions were placed, and before them on wooden plates were pancakes of millet flour and melted butter in a cup, and the Tatar beer called Buza in a pitcher. They ate with their fingers and all dipped into the butter. The dark man leapt up, bade Jelin sit on one side, not on a rug but on the bare floor. Going back again to his rug, he handed his guests cakes and Buza. The servant showed Jelin his place. He himself took off his shoes, placed them by the door in a row with the slippers of the other guests, and took his seat on the felt as near as possible to his master's. And while they eat, he looks at them, and his mouth waters. After the Tatars had finished eating, a Tatar woman entered, dressed in the same sort of shirt as the girl wore, and in pantalets. Her head was covered with a handkerchief. She carried out the butter and the cakes, and brought a handsome finger bowl and a pitcher with a narrow nose. The Tatars finished washing their hands, then they folded their arms, knelt down, and puffed on all sides, and said their prayers. They talked in their own tongue. Then one of the guests, a Tatar, approached Jelin and began to speak to him in Russian. Kazi Mohammed made you prisoner, said he, pointing to the red-bearded Tatar, and he has given you to Abdul Murat, indicating the dark one. Abdul Murat is now your master. Jelin said nothing. Abdul Murat began to talk, all the time pointing toward Jelin, and grinned as he talked. Soldat Rus, Grosho Rus. The interpreter went on to say, He commands you to write a letter home, and have them send money to ransom you. As soon as money is sent, he will set you free. Jelin pondered a little, and then said, Does he wish a large ransom? The Tatars took counsel together, and then the interpreter said, Three thousand silver rubles. No, replied Jelin, I can't pay that. Abdul leapt up, began to gesticulate, and talked to Jelin. He seemed all the time to think that Jelin understood him. The interpreter translated his words. He means, says he, how much will you give? Jelin, after pondering a little, said, five hundred rubles. Then the Tartars all began to talk at once. Abdul began to scream at the red-bearded Tartar. He grew so excited as he talked that the spittle flew from his mouth. But the red-bearded Tartar only frowned and clucked with his tongue. When all became silent again, the interpreter said, Five hundred rubles is not enough to buy you of your master. He himself has paid two hundred for you. Kazi Mohammed was in debt to him. He took you for the debt. Three thousand rubles, it is no use to send less. But if you don't write, they will put you in a hole and flog you with a whip. Ugh, thinks Jelin, the more cowardly one is, the worse it is for him. He leapt to his feet and said, Now you tell him, dog, that he is, that if he thinks he is going to frighten me, that I will not give him a single kopeck, nor will I write. I am not afraid of you, and you will never make me afraid of you, you dog. The interpreter translated this, and again they all began to talk at once. They gabbled a long time. Then the dark one got up and came to Jeline. Oros, says he. Jigit, jigit oros. The word jigit among them signifies a brave young man. And he grinned, said something to the interpreter, and the interpreter said, Give a thousand rubles. Jeline would not give in. I will not pay more than five hundred. But if you kill me, you will get nothing at all. The Tatars consulted together, sent out the servant, and they themselves looked first at the door, then at Jeline. The servant returned, followed by a rather stout man in bare feet and almost stripped. His feet also were in stocks. Jeline made an exclamation. He recognized Kostulin, and they brought him in and placed him next his comrade. The two began to talk together, and the Tatars looked on and listened in silence. Jeline told how it had gone with him. Kostulin told how his horse had stood stock still and his gun had missed fire, and that the same Abdul had overtaken him and captured him. Abdul listened, pointed to Kostulin, and muttered something. 
The interpreter translated his words to mean that they now both belonged to the same master, and that the one who paid the ransom first would be freed first. Now, says he to Jeline, you lose your temper so easily, but your comrade is calm. He has written a letter home. They will send five thousand silver roubles, and so he will be well fed, and he won't be hurt. And Jeline said, Let my comrade do as he pleases. Maybe he is rich, but I am not rich. I will do as I have already told you. Kill me if you wish, but it would not do you any good, and I will not pay you more than five hundred roubles. They were silent. Suddenly Abdul leapt up, brought a little chest, took out a pen, a sheet of paper, and ink, and pushed them into Jeline's hands, then tapped him on the shoulder and said by signs, Write. He had agreed to take the five hundred roubles. Wait a minute, said Jeline to the interpreter. Tell him that he must feed us well, clothe us, and give us good decent footwear, and let us stay together. We want to have a good time, and lastly, that he take off these clogs. He looked at his Tatar master and smiled. The master also smiled, and when he learned what was wanted, said, I will give you the best clothes, a cherkeska, and boots, fit for a wedding. Footnote, a cherkeska, a sort of long Circassian cloak. End of footnote. And I will feed you like princes, and if you want to live together, why, you can live in the barn. But it won't do to take away the clogs. You would run away. Only at night will I have them taken off. Then he jumped up, tapped him on the shoulder. You good, me good. Jeline wrote his letter, but he put on it the wrong address, so that it might never reach its destination. He said to himself, I shall run away. They took Jeline and Kostulin to the barn, strewed corn stalks, gave them water in a pitcher, and bread, two old Cherkeski, and some worn-out military boots. It was evident that they had been stolen from some dead soldier. When night came, they took off their clogs and locked them up in the barn. Chapter 3 Thus, Jeline and his comrade lived a whole month. Their master was always on the grin. You, Ivan, good. Me, Abdul, good. But he gave them wretched food, unleavened bread made of millet flour, cooked in the form of cakes, but often not heated through. Kostilin wrote home again, and was anxiously awaiting the arrival of the money, and lost his spirits. Whole days at a time, he sat in the barn and counted the days till his money should arrive, or else he slept. But Jilin had no expectation that his letter would reach its destination, and he did not write another. Where, he asked himself, where would my mother get the money for my ransom? And besides, she lived for the most part on what I used to send her. If she made out to raise five hundred roubles, she would be in want to the end of her days. If God wills it, I may escape. And all the time he kept his eyes open and made plans to elude his captors. He walked about the owl, he amused himself by whistling, or else he sat down and fashioned things, either modeling dolls out of clay or plating baskets of osseas, for Jeline was a master at all sorts of handiwork. One time he had made a doll with nose and hands and feet and dressed in a Tartar shirt, and he set the doll on the roof. The Tartar women were going for water. Dina, the master's daughter, caught sight of the doll. She called the Tartar girls. They set down their jugs and looked and laughed. Jeline took the doll and offered it to them. They keep laughing but don't dare to take it. He left the doll, went to the barn, and watched what would take place. Dina ran up to the doll, looked around, seized the doll, and fled. The next morning at dawn, he sees Dina come out on the doorstep with the doll, and she has already dressed it up in red rags and was rocking it like a little child and singing a lullaby in her own language. An old woman came out, gave her a scolding, snatched the doll away, broke it in pieces, and sent Dina to her work. Jeline made another doll, a still better one, and gave it to Dina. One time Dina brought a little jug, put it down, took a seat, and looked at him. Then she laughed and pointed to the jug. What is she so gay about, thinks Jeline. He took the jug and began to drink. He supposed that it was water, but it was milk. He drank up the milk. Good, says he. How delighted Dina was. Good, Ivan, good. And she jumped up, clapped her hands, snatched the jug, and ran away. And from that time she began to bring him secretly fresh milk every day. Now sometimes the Tatars would make cheesecakes out of goat's milk and dry them on their roofs. 
Then she used to carry some of these cakes secretly to him, and another time, when her father had killed a sheep, she brought him a piece of mutton in her sleeve. She threw it down and ran away. One time there was a tremendous shower, and for a whole hour the rain poured as from buckets, and all the brooks grew royally. Wherever there had been a ford, the depth of the water increased to seven feet, and boulders were rolled along by it. Everywhere torrents were rushing, the mountains were full of the roaring. Now, when the shower was over, streams were pouring all through the village. Jelin asked his master for a knife, whittled out a cylinder and some paddles, and made a water wheel, and fastened mannequins at the two ends. The little girls brought him some rags, and he dressed up the mannequins, one like a man, the other like a woman. He fastened them on, and put the wheel in a brook. The wheel revolved, and the dolls danced. The whole village collected, the little boys and the little girls, the women, and even the Tatars, came and clucked with their tongues. Ayurus! Ayyavan! Abdul had a Russian watch, which had been broken. He took it and showed it to Jeline, and clucked with his tongue. Jeline said, Let me have it, I will fix it. He took it, opened the penknife, took it apart, then he put it together again, and gave it back. The watch ran. The Tatar was delighted, brought him his old beshmet, which was all in rags, and gave it to him. Nothing else to be done, he took it and used it as a covering at night. From that time, Jeline's fame went abroad, that he was a master. Even from distant villages, they came to him. One brought him a gun lock, or a pistol to repair, another a watch. His master furnished him with tools, a pair of pinchers and gimlets, and a little file. One time a Tatar fell ill. They came to Jeline. Come cure him. Jeline knew nothing of medicine. He went, looked at the sick man, said to himself, Perhaps he will get well anyway. He went into the barn, took water and sand, and shook them up together. He whispered a few words to the water in presence of the Tatars, and gave it to the sick man to drink. Fortunately for him, the Tatar got well. Jeline had by this time learned something of their language, and some of the Tatars became accustomed to him. When they wanted him, they called him by name, Ivan, Ivan, but others always looked at him as though he was a wild beast. The red-bearded Tatar did not like Jelin. When he saw him, he scowled and turned away, or else insulted him. There was another old man among them. He did not live in the Owl, but came down from the mountain. Jelin never saw him except when he came to the mosque to pray. He was of small stature. On his cap, he wore a white handkerchief as an ornament. His beard and mustaches were trimmed. They were white as wool, and his face was wrinkled and brick red. His nose was hooked like a hawk's, and his eyes were gray and cruel, and he had no teeth except two tusks. He used to come in his turban, leaning on his staff and glare like a wolf. Whenever he saw Jeline, he would snort and turn his back. One time, Jeline went to the mountain to see where the old man lived. He descended a narrow path and sees a little stone-walled garden. On the other side of the wall are cherry trees, peach trees, and a little hut with a flat roof. He went near. He sees beehives made of straw and bees flying and humming around them, and the old man is on his knees before the hives, hammering something. Jeline raised himself up so as to get a better view, and his clog made a noise. The old man looked up, squealed. He pulled his pistol from his belt and fired at Jeline, who had barely time to hide behind the wall. The old man came to make his complaint to Jeline's master. Abdul called him in, grinned, and asked him, Why did you go to the old man's? I didn't do him any harm. I wanted to see how he lived. Abdul explained it to the old man, but he was angry, hissed, mumbled something, showed his tusks, and threatened Jeline with his hands. Jeline did not understand it at all, but he made out that the old man wished Abdul to kill the two Russians and not have them in the owl. The old man went off. Jeline began to ask his master, Who is that old man? And the master replied, He is a great man. He used to be our first jigit. He has killed many Russians. He used to be rich. He had three wives and eight sons, all lived in one village. The Russians came, destroyed his village, and killed seven of his sons. One son was left and surrendered to the Russians. The old man went and gave himself up to the Russians also. He lived among them three months, found his son, killed him with his own hand, and escaped. Since that time, he has stopped fighting. 
He went to Mecca to pray to God, and that's why he wears a turban. Whoever has been to Mecca is called a haji and wears a chalma. But he does not love you Russians. He has bade me kill you, but I don't intend to kill you. I have paid out money for you. And besides Ivan, I have come to like you. And so far from wishing to kill you, I would rather not let you go from me at all if I had not given my word. He laughed and began to repeat in Russian, Tvoya Ivan, Khorosh, <laughs> Moya Abdul, Khorosh. Chapter 4 Thus Jeline lived a month. In the daytime he walked about the owl, or did some handiwork, but when night came, and it grew quiet in the owl, he burrowed in his barn. It was hard work digging because of the stones, and he sometimes had to use his file on them, and thus he dug a hole under the wall, big enough to crawl through. Only, he thought, I must know the region a little first, so as to escape in the right direction, and the Tatars wouldn't tell me anything. He waited till one time when his master was absent, and he went after dinner behind the owl to a mountain. His idea was to reconnoiter the country. But when Abdul returned, he commanded a small boy to follow Jeline and not take his eyes from him. The little fellow tagged after Jeline and kept crying, Don't go there. Father won't allow it. I will call the men if you go. Jeline began to reason with him. I am not going far, says he, only to that hill. I must get some herbs. Come with me. I can't run away with this clog. Tomorrow I will make you a bow and arrows. He persuaded the lad. They went together. To look at, the mountain is not far, but it was hard work with the clog. He went a little distance at a time, pulling himself up by main strength. Jeline sat down on the summit and began to survey the ground. To the south behind the barn lay a valley through which a herd was grazing, and another owl was in sight at the foot of it. Back of the village was another hill still steeper, and back of that still another. Between the mountains lay a further stretch of forest, and then still other mountains constantly rising higher and higher, and higher than all stood snow-capped peaks, white as sugar, and one snowy peak rose like a dome above them all. To the east and west also were mountains. In every direction the smoke of owls was to be seen in the ravines. Well, he said to himself, this is all their country. He began to look in the direction of the Russian possessions. At his very feet was a little river, his village surrounded by gardens. By the river some women, no larger in appearance than little dolls, were standing and washing. Behind the owl was a lower mountain, and beyond it two other mountains covered with forests. And between the two mountains, a plain stretched far, far away in the blue distance, and on the plain lay what seemed like smoke. Jeline tried to remember in what direction, when he lived at home in the fortress, the sun used to rise, and where it set. He looked. Just about there, says he, in that valley our fortress ought to be. There between those two mountains I must make my escape. The little sun began to slope toward the west. The snowy mountains changed from white to purple. The wooded mountains grew dark. A mist arose from the valley, and the valley itself, where the Russian fortress must be, glowed in the sunset as though it were on fire. Jeline strained his gaze. Something seemed to hang waving in the air, like smoke arising from chimneys, and so it seemed to him that it must be from the fortress itself, the Russian fortress. It was already growing late. The voice of the mullah calling to prayer was heard. The herds began to return. The kine were lowing. The little lad kept repeating, Let us go! But Jeline could not tear himself away. They returned home. Well, thinks Jeline, now I know the place. I must make my escape. He proposed to make his escape that very night. The nights were dark. It was the wane of the moon. Unfortunately, the Tartars returned in the evening. Usually they came in driving the cattle with them, and came in hilarious. But this time they had no cattle. But they brought a Tartar, dead on his saddle. It was Kazi Mohammed's brother. They rode in solemnly, and collected for the burial. Jeline also went out to look. They did not put the dead body in a coffin, but wrapped it in linen, and placed it under a plane tree in the village, where it lay on the sward. The mullah came. The old men gathered together, their caps bound around with handkerchiefs. They took off their shoes and sat in rows on their heels before the dead. 
In front was the mullah, behind him three old men in turbans, and behind them the rest of the Tartars. The mullah lifted the dead man's head and said, Allah, that means God. He said this one word and let the head fall back. All were silent. They sat motionless. Again the mullah lifted the head, saying, Allah, and all repeated it after him, Allah. Then silence again. The dead man lay on the sward. He was motionless, and they sat as though they were dead. Not one made a motion. The only sound was the rustling of the foliage of the plane tree, stirred by the breeze. Then the mullah offered a prayer. All got to their feet. They took the dead body in their arms and carried it away. They brought it to a pit. The pit was not a mere hole, but was hollowed out under the earth like a cellar. They took the body under the armpits and by the legs, doubled it up and led it down gently, shoved it forcibly under the ground and laid the arms along the belly. The Nogai brought a green osier. They laid it in the pit, then they quickly filled it up with earth, and over the dead man's head they placed a gravestone. They smoothed the earth over and again sat around the grave in rows. There was a long silence. Allah! Allah, Allah, they sighed and got up. The red-bearded Tatar gave money to the old men, then he got up, struck his forehead three times with a whip, and went home. The next morning, Jalin seized the red-haired Tatar leading a mare through the village, and three Tatars following him. They went behind the village. Kazi Mohammed took off his beshmet, rolled up his sleeves, his hands were powerful, took out his dagger, and sharpened it on a whetstone. The Tartars held back the mare's head. Kazi Mohammed approached and cut the throat. Then he turned the animal over and began to flay it, pulling away the hide with his mighty fists. The women and maidens came and began to wash the intestines and the lights. Then they cut up the mare and carried the meat to the hut, and the whole village collected at the Qazi Muhammad's to celebrate the dead. For three days they feasted on the mare and drank booza. Thus they celebrated the dead. All the Tatars were at home. On the fourth day, about noon, Jilin sees that they are collecting for some expedition. Their horses are brought out. They put on their gear and started off, ten men of them, under the command of the Qazi Muhammad. Only Abdul stayed at home. There was a new moon, but the nights were still dark. Now, thinks Jilin, today we must escape. And he tells Kostulin. But Kostulin was afraid. How can we escape? We don't know the way. I know the way. But we should not get there during the night. Well, if we don't get there, we will spend the night in the woods. I have some cakes. What are you going to do? It will be all right if they send you the money. But you see, your friends may not collect so much. And the Tartars are now angry because the Russians have killed one of their men. They say they are thinking of killing us. Kostulin thought and thought. All right, let us go. Chapter 5 Jalin crept down into his hole and widened it so that Kostulin also could get through, and then they sat and waited till all should be quiet in the all. As soon as the people were quiet in the all, Jalin crept under the wall and came out on the other side. He whispers to Kostulin, Crawl under! Kostulin also crept under, but in doing so, he hit a stone with his leg, and it made a noise. Now the master had a brindled dog as a watch, a most ferocious animal. They called him Ulyashin. Jelin had been in the habit of feeding him. Ulyashin heard the noise and began to bark and jump about, and the other dogs joined in. Jelin gave a little whistle, threw him a piece of cake. Ulyashin recognized him, began to wag his tail, and ceased barking. Abdul had heard the disturbance and cried from within the hut, Hayit! Hayit Ulyashin! But Jilin scratched the dog behind the ears. The dog makes no more sound, rubs against his legs, and wags his tail. They wait behind the corner. All became silent again. The only sound was the bleating of a sheep in the fold, and far below them, the water roaring over the pebbles. It is dark, but the sky is studded with stars. Over the mountain, the young moon hung red, with its horns turned upward. In the valleys, a mist was rising, white as milk. Jilin started up and said to his comrade in Tatar, Well, brother, Aida. They set out again, but as they get under way, they hear the call of the mullah on the minaret, Allah, Bismillah, Rahman. 
That means the people will be going to the mosque. Again they sat down and hid under the wall. They sat there long, waiting until the people should pass. Again it grew still. Now for our fate. They crossed themselves and started. They went across the Dvor and down the steep bank to the stream, crossed the stream, proceeded along the valley. The mist was thick and closed in all around them, but above their heads the stars could still be seen. Jolene used the stars to guide him which way to go. It was cool in the mist. It was easy walking. Only their boots were troublesome. They were worn at the heels. Jolene took his off, threw them away, and walked barefoot. He sprang from stone to stone and kept glancing at the stars. Costulin began to grow weary. Go slower, says he. My boots chafe me. My whole foot is raw. Then take them off. It will be easier. Costulin began to go barefoot, but that was still worse. He kept scraping his feet on the stones and having to stop. Jeline said to him, You may cut your feet, but you will save your life. But if you are caught, they will kill you, which would be worse. Costulin said nothing, but crept along, groaning. For a long time they went down the valley. Suddenly they hear dogs barking at the right. Jeline halted, looked around, climbed up the bank, and felt about with his hands. Ugh, says he, we have made a mistake. We have gone too far to the right. Here's one of the enemy's villages. I could see it from the hill. We must go back to the left, up the mountain. There must be a forest there. But Costulin objected. Just wait a little while. Let us get breath. My feet are still blood. Eh, brother, they will get well. You should walk more lightly. This way. And Jeline turned back toward the left, and uphill toward the forest. Costulin kept halting and groaning. Jeline tried to hush him up, and still hastened on. They climbed the mountain, and there they found the forest. They entered it. Their clothes were all torn to pieces on the thorns. They found a little path through the woods. They walked along it. Halt! There was the sound of hoofs on the path. They stopped to listen. It sounded like the tramping of a horse. Then it also stopped. They set out once more, again, the tramping hoofs. When they stopped, it stopped. Jeline crept ahead and investigated a light spot on the path. Something is standing there. It may be a horse, or it may not. But on it, there is something strange, not at all like a man. It snorted plainly. What a strange thing! Jeline gave a slight whistle. There was a dash of feet from the path into the forest, a crackling in the underbrush, and something rushed along like a hurricane with a crashing of dry boughs. Costulin almost fell to the ground in fright, but Jeline laughed and said, That was a stag! Do you hear how it crashes through the woods with its horns? We frightened him, and he frightened us. They went on their way. Already the great bear was beginning to set. The dawn was not distant, and they were in doubt whether they should come out right or not. Jeline was inclined to think that they were on the right track, and that it would be about ten versts farther before they reached the Russian fortress. But there is no certain guide. You could not tell in the night. They came to a little clearing. Costulin sat down and said, Do as you please, but I will not go any farther. My legs won't carry me. Jeline tried to persuade him. No, says he. I won't go. I can't go. Jeline grew angry. He threatens him. He scolds him. Then I will go on without you. Goodbye. Costulin jumped up and followed. They went four versts farther. The fog began to grow thicker in the forest. Nothing could be seen before them. The stars were barely visible. Suddenly they hear the tramping of a horse just in front of them. They can hear his shoes striking on the stones. Jeline threw himself down on his belly and tried to listen by laying his ear to the ground. Yes, it is. It is someone on horseback coming in our direction. They slipped off to one side of the road, crouched down in the bushes, and waited. Jeline crept close to the path and looked. He sees a mounted Tartar riding along, driving a cow. The man is muttering to himself. When the Tartar had ridden by, Jeline returned to Costulin. Well, God has saved us. Up with you. Come along. Costulin tried to rise and fell back. I can't. By God, I can't. My strength is all gone. The man was as though he were drunk. He was all of a sweat. And as they were surrounded by the cold fog and his feet were torn, he was quite used up. Jeline tried to lift him by main force. Then Costulin cried, Ay! It hurt! Jeline was frightened to death. What are you screaming for? Don't you know that Tatar is near? He will hear you. But he said to himself, Now he has really played out. What can I do with him? I can't abandon a comrade. Now, says he, get up. Climb on my back. I will carry you if you can't walk any longer. He took Costulin on his shoulders, 
holding him by the thighs, and went along the path with his burden. Only, says he, don't put your hands on my throat for Christ's sake. Lean on my shoulders. It was hard for Jolien. His feet were also bloody, and he was weary. He stopped and made it a little easier for himself by setting Costulin down and getting him better mounted. Then he went on again. Evidently the Tatar had heard them when Costilin screamed. Jolien caught the sound of someone following them and shouting in his language. Jolien put into the bushes. The Tatar aimed his gun. He fired it off, but missed began to whine in his native tongue, and galloped up the path. Well, says Jeline, we are lost, brother. The dog, he will be right back with a band of Tartars on our track. If we don't succeed in putting three verses between us, we are lost. And he thinks to himself, the devil take it that I had to bring this clod along with me. Alone I should have got there long ago. Costilin said, go alone. Why should you be lost on my account? No, I will not go. It would not do to abandon a comrade. He lifted him again on his shoulder and started on. Thus he made a verst. It was forest all the way and no sign of outlet, but the fog was now beginning to lift and seemed to be floating away in little clouds. Not a star could be seen. Jolene was tired out. A little spring gushed out by the road. It was walled in with stones. There he stopped and dropped Costulin. Let me rest a little, says he, and get a drink. We will eat our cakes. It can't be very far now. He had just stretched himself out to drink when the sound of hoofs was heard behind them. Again they hid in the bushes at the right, under the crest, and crouched down. They heard Tatar voices. The Tatars stopped at the very spot where they had turned in from the road. After discussing a while, they seemed to be setting dogs on the scent. The refugees heard the sound of a crashing through the bushes. A strange dog comes directly to them. He stops and barks. The Tatars followed on their track. They are also strangers. They seized them, bound them, lifted them on horses, and carried them off. After they had ridden three versts, Abdul, with two Tatars, met them. He said something to their new captors. They were transferred to Abdul's horses and were brought back to the Al. Abdul was no longer grinning, and he said not a word to them. They reached the village at daybreak. The prisoners were left in the street. The children gathered around them, tormenting them with stones and whips and howling. The Tatars gathered around them in a circle, and the old man from the mountain was among them. They began to discuss. Jolien made out that they were deciding on what should be done with them. Some said that they ought to be sent farther into the mountains, but the old man declared that they must be killed. Abdul argued against it. Says he, I have paid out money for them. I shall get a ransom for them. But the old man said, they won't pay anything. It will only be an injury to us. And it is a sin to keep Russians alive. Kill them, and that is the end of it. They separated. Abdul came to Jeline and reported the decision. If, says he, the ransom is not sent in two weeks, you will be flogged, and if you try to run away again, I will kill you like a dog. Write your letter and write it good. Paper was brought them. They wrote their letters. Clogs were put on their feet again. They were taken behind the mosque. There was a pit of twelve feet deep, and they were thrust down into this pit. Chapter 6 Life was made utterly wretched for them. Their clogs were not taken off even at night, and they were not let out at all. Unbaked dough was thrown down to them as though they were dogs, and water was let down in a jug. In the pit it was damp and suffocating. Costulin became ill and swelled up and had rheumatism all over his body, and he groaned or slept all the time. Even Jolien lost his spirits. He sees that they are in desperate straits, and he does not know how to get out. He had begun to make an excavation, but there was nowhere to hide the earth. Abdul discovered it and threatened to kill him. He was squatting down one time in the pit and thinking about life and liberty, and he grew sad. Suddenly a cake fell directly into his lap, then another, and some cherries followed. He looked up, and there was Dina. She peered down at him, laughed, and then ran away. Angeline began to conjecture. Couldn't Dina help me? He cleared out a little place in the pit, picked up some clay, and made some dolls. He made men and women, horses and dogs. He said to himself, when Dina comes, I will give them to her. But Dina did not make her appearance on the next day. Angeline hears the trampling of horses' hoofs. Men came riding up. The Tatars collected at the mosque, arguing, shouting, and talking about the Russians. The voice of the old man was heard. 
Jeline could not understand very well, but he made out that the Russians were somewhere near, and the Tartars were afraid that they would attack the Owl, and they did not know what to do with the prisoners. They talked a while and went away. Suddenly, Jeline heard a rustling at the edge of the pit. He sees Dina squatting on her heels, with her knees higher than her head. She leaned over, her necklace hung down and swung over the pit, and her little eyes twinkled like stars. She took from her sleeve two cheesecakes and threw them down to him. Jeline accepted them and said, Why did you stay away so long? I have been making you some dolls. Here they are. He began to toss them up to her, one at a time. But she shook her head and would not look at them. I can't take them, said she. She said nothing more for a time, but sat there. Then she said, Ivan, they want to kill you. She made a significant motion across her throat. Who wants to kill me? Father, the old man has ordered him to, but I am sorry for you. And Jeline said, Well, then if you are sorry for me, bring me a long stick. She shook her head, meaning that it was impossible. He clasped his hands in supplication to her. Dina, please, bring one to me, Danushka. I can't, said she. They would see me. They are all at home. And she ran away. Afterwards, Jeline was sitting there in the evening and wondering what he should do. He kept raising his eyes. He could see the stars, but the moon was not yet up. The mullah uttered his call. Then all became silent. Jeline began already to doze, thinking to himself, The little maid is afraid. Suddenly a piece of clay fell on his head. He glanced up. A long pole was sliding over the edge of the pit. It slid out, began to descend toward him. It reached the bottom of the pit. Jeline was delighted. He seized it, pulled it along. It was a strong pole. He had noticed it before on Abdul's roof. He gazed up. The stars were shining high in the heavens, and Dina's eyes at the edge of the pit gleamed in the darkness like a cat's. She craned her head over and whispered, Ivan, Ivan, and she waved her hands before her face, meaning softly, please. What is it? said Jeline. All have gone. There are only two at home. And Jeline said, Well, Costulin, let us go. Let us make our last attempt. I will help you. Costulin, however, would not hear to it. No, says he, it is not meant for me to get away from here. How could I go when I haven't even strength to turn over? All right, then. Goodbye. Don't think me unkind. He kissed Costulin. He clasped the pole, told Dina to hold it firmly, and tried to climb up. Twice he fell back, his clog so impeded him. Costulin boosted him. He managed to get to the top. Dina pulled on the sleeves of his shirt with all her might, laughing heartily. Jeline pulled up the pole and said, Carry it back to its place, Dina, for if they found it, they would flog you. She dragged off the pole, and Jeline began to go down the mountain. When he had reached the bottom of the cliff, he took a sharp stone and tried to break the padlock of his clog. But the lock was strong. He could not strike it fairly. He hears someone hurrying down the hill with light, skipping steps. He thinks that is probably Dina again. Dina ran to him, took a stone, and says, Let me try it. She knelt down and began to work with all her might, but her hands were as delicate as osseous. She had no strength. She threw down the stone and burst into tears. Jeline again tried to break the lock, and Dina squatted by his side and leaned against his shoulder. Jeline glanced up and saw at the left behind the mountain a red glow like a fire. It was the moon just rising. Well, he says to himself, I must cross the valley and get into the woods before the moon rises. He stood up and threw away the stone. No matter for the clog, he must take it with him. Goodbye, says he. Danushka, I shall always remember you. Dina clung to him, reached with her hands for a place to stow away some cakes. He took the cakes. Thank you, said he. You are a thoughtful darling. Who will make you dolls after I am gone? And he stroked her hair. Dina burst into tears, hid her face in her hands, and scrambled up the hillside like a kid. He could hear in the darkness the jingling of the coins on her braids. Jeline crossed himself, picked up the lock of his clog so that it might not make a noise, and started on his way, dragging his leg all the time and keeping his eyes constantly on the glow where the moon was rising. He knew the way. He had eight versts to go in a direct course, but he would have to strike into the forest before the moon came entirely up. He crossed the stream, and now the light was increasing behind the mountain. He proceeded along the valley. It was growing light. 
He walks along, constantly glancing around, but still the moon was not visible. The glow was now changing to white light, and one side of the valley grew brighter and brighter. The shadow crept away from the mountain till it reached its very foot. Jeline still hurried along, all the time keeping to the shadow. He hurries as fast as he can, but the moon rises still faster, and now at the right the mountain tops are illuminated. He struck into the forest just as the moon rose above the mountains. It became as light and white as day. On the trees all the leaves were visible. It was warm and bright on the mountainside. Everything seemed as though it were dead. The only sound was the roaring of a torrent far below. He walked along in the forest. He had met no one. Jeline found a little spot in the forest where it was still darker, and he began to rest. While he rested, he ate one of his cakes. He procured a stone and once more tried to break the padlock, but he only bruised his hands and failed to break the lock. He arose and went on his way. When he had gone a verst, his strength gave out. His feet were sore. He had to walk ten steps at a time and then rest. There's nothing to be done for it, says he to himself. I will push on as long as my strength holds out. For if I sit down, then I shall not get up again. If I do not reach the fortress before it is daylight, then I will lie down in the woods and spend the day and start on tomorrow night again. He walked all night. Once he passed two Tartars on horseback, but he heard them at some distance and hid behind a tree. Already the moon was beginning to pale. The dew had fallen. It was near dawn, and Jeline had not reached the end of the forest. Well, says he to himself, I will go thirty steps farther, strike into the forest, and sit down. He went thirty steps and sees the end of the forest. He went to the edge. It was broad daylight. Before him, as on the palm of his hand, were the steps and the fortress. And on the left, not far away on the mountainside, fires were burning or dying out. The smoke rose, and men were moving around the watch fires. He looks and sees the gleaming of firearms. Cossacks! Soldiers! Jeline was overjoyed. He gathered his remaining strength and walked down the mountain. And he says to himself, God help me if a mounted Tatar should get sight of me on this bare field. I should not escape him, even though I am so near. Even while these thoughts are passing through his mind, he sees at the left, on a hillock, not fourteen hundred feet away, three Tatars on the watch. They caught sight of him, bore down upon him. Then his heart failed within him. Waving his arms, he shouted at the top of his voice, Brothers! Help! Brothers! Our men heard him. Mounted Cossacks dashed out toward him. The Cossacks were far off, the Tartars near. And now Jeline collected his last remaining energies, seized his clog with his hand, ran toward the Cossacks, and without any consciousness of feeling, crossed himself and cried, Brothers! 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 The Cossacks were fifteen in number. The Tartars were dismayed. Before they reached him, they stopped short, and Jeline reached the Cossacks. The Cossacks surrounded him and questioned him, Who are you? What is your name? Where did you come from? But Jeline was almost beside himself. He wept and kept on shouting, Brothers! Brothers! The soldiers hastened up and gathered around him. One brought him bread, another kasha gruel, another vodka, another threw a cloak around him. Still another broke his chains. The officers recognized him. They brought him into the fortress. The soldiers were delighted. His comrades pressed into Jeline's room. Jeline told them what had happened to him, and he ended his tale with the words, That's the way I went home and got married. No, I see that such is not to be my fate. And he remained in the service in the Caucasus. At the end of a month, Kostilin was ransomed for 5,000 rubles. He was brought home scarcely alive. End of A Prisoner in the Caucasus by Leo Tolstoy This LibriVox recording is in the public domain.